Today on the stream, we're joined by special guest Mo Ibrahim, the billionaire philanthropist who made his fame and fortune developing mobile phone services across the African continent. Now he's giving back through his work focused on promoting good governance and leadership in Africa. Joining us from London, Mo Ibrahim is the founder of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation and the Mo Ibrahim Prize, the world's largest prize awarded for excellence to a departing African leader. His foundation also puts together an ambitious one-of-a-kind index on African governance, and that was released today. And Ibrahim has called it a mirror to record exactly what is happening on the continent. Mo, it's great to have you on the stream. When I think of African governance, good governance, I think about you. When I hear your name, I think about good African go governance. But when you were a young man, what was it that you wanted to do? What was your ambition? Uh, I loved the uh, sciences. I'm an engineer by uh, training. And uh, I really want to be, uh, wanted to be a scientist. And uh, my role model was people like Einstein. And uh, uh, that, that, that's the thing really I, I wanted to do. I have no inclination to be a businessman or to be a philanthropist. Well, I was too poor anyway to try to be a philanthropist. I have a picture here, and this is you picking up an honorary university degree at Bradford University, and it's with your old professor, John Gardiner. What kind of student were you? Were you a diligent student? Uh, yes, I think I was reasonable. I was usually top of my class. Uh, we. My mother always installed in us the importance of education. Uh, that is a way forward for us, a way out of poverty. And uh, it was very important for us to, to study. I was, I was always a good student. So from there, of course, to your foundation, we got this tweet from Abdul Wahab saying, what motivated you to start your foundation, which, of course, is one of the things you are known for now. What was the impetus behind that? Uh, I'm a Nubian. Uh, Nubian is an old race, comes from the area north of Sudan, south of Egypt, and uh, we lived there for thousands of years. Uh, social cohesion, uh, caring for the community is part of our culture. I was lucky. Uh, I was a boy who made it good. I uh, never expected uh, to be a rich man, and uh, once you make some money, then what is the point? What, what are you going to do with that? Mm. Uh, I really wanted to give it back, and uh, to give it back in a meaningful way. Uh, it's, you know, food for children, uh, tents, uh, uh, milk powder, medicine. That's all wonderful, and I love the people doing that. But I thought if I can find a way to stop, help stop really being, people being poor, being needy, to, to, to deal with the really root of the problem uh, uh, instead of the symptoms, because there is no need for Africans to be poor, because the continent is rich and there's not many African people. Uh, so uh, we need to find the root. Why, why are we poor? And uh, the answer I came up with was, is because misrule. We are badly governed. And uh, if we can improve the governance, uh, then we can move forward. That's why I'm trying to focus all my work in the area of governance to really uh, ensure that we, we have a better future for our children. Mo, I asked our online audience serious question here. What makes a good African leader? I want to share with you some of their responses. Dele says, a good African leader has a clear vision and is goal orientated. The leader must be honest and worthy of trust. He goes on to say he shuns corruption, doesn't undermine constitutional and fundamental rights of the governs. This we do not have. Let me show you another one here. Al Mansour says, the leader must love his people. Sadly, most African leaders don't. <laughs> And then Sammy, <laughs> these are his qualifications. Transparent and brave. These values disappear from our world. A leader such as Mandela, they're now only stories. What do you make of that? There's this hope, but also this reality. Uh, no, listen, I mean, that, that is, that's not fair. We have some wonderful leaders for Africa, in Africa. I mean, uh, look, 
Femi, the problem is that we have a few bad apples which, who, who make the news. You ask everybody, do you know Mobutu? You say, yeah, 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 we know Mobutu. We know uh, Idi Amin. We know, uh, but anybody knows Festus Mukhai? Anybody knows Masiri? Anybody knows Shisano? Pohama? Uh, there's a lot of wonderful leaders, but the media doesn't talk about them. I mean, I can tell you wonderful stories about many of those leaders who many of them won our award. And uh, unfortunately, we African people even don't know our heroes. And uh, that, is, that is really unfortunate. And while I love that you are keeping it positive here, I, I kind of hate to be the bearer of bad news because one of the things that our community brings up time and time again is, yes, there are good leaders, but there's also endemic corruption. Of course, corruption happens all around the world and takes different forms, different names. But this is one of the things people tweeted at, at us about challenges to good governance. Uh, Robert says, corruption is the order of the day in Uganda. Uh, Enam says, corruption, systemic rot, bribery, rife in Africa, Nigeria particularly. And one other person, Sarki, says, corruption, 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 when we asked about the challenges of governance. Now, I know that when you launched your mobile communications company, that would eventually become Celtel. You were pretty adamant about keeping things transparent, keeping corruption and bribery out of the dealings. How did you do that? Uh, it was simple. I mean, first we had a wonderful board uh, and we insisted that all my key shareholders should, should be in the board. Fortunately, I had uh, uh, investors from the IFC, the International Financial Corporation, the Dualit Bank, uh, CDC, which is really British government, uh, OPEC, uh, which is the American government, uh, the German Development Agency, which is German government, FMO, which is Dutch government. Yes, admittedly, uh, there were small shareholders, 3%, 4%, 5%, but I insisted to have all those people on the board. So we had a board which has really a lot of powerful players. And uh, we took a resolution that any chief executive running any of our companies in Africa uh, who cannot dispense more than thirty dollars, thirty thousand uh, dollars. Any larger sums had to get had the approval of the board. So nobody can go to the to, to CEO and say, "Give me a couple of millions. I have an election here." I you say, "Sure, you know, we'll." Have, I write to the board, but that board is. Nobody would try to write to that kind of board asking for bribery. And uh, to be honest, very few people ask for bribery. And uh, once people know that you don't pay bribes, nobody will bothers you. And uh, we have always to remember that uh, bribery is like adultery. It takes two uh, to, to commit that. So uh, business also is responsible for bribery. And we we'll always complain about this issue. Look, we we take bribery serious, and we hold our officials in Africa accountable, and we keep talking about it and expose it. But what about the business people who are involved in that? Do you know that all European countries only delegitimized or criminalized corruption around the year 2000, only 17 years before that? Corruption and bribery was legitimate. Actually, it was tax deductible. Uh, same guys lecturing Africans about bribery were letting their business people bribe our leaders and actually give them tax incentives also to do it. Right. 2,000 people made it a crime. So then we asked the question, When's the last time we heard that Germany or France or Denmark or Sweden uh, or indeed Britain uh, did take any businessman to court over bribery in Africa? I haven't heard about that. So the business people are getting scot free. Nobody's shedding the light on that. So we need to understand really, unless the international community also become serious about the issue of corruption who cannot move forward. We have been talking about anonymous companies, where companies where nobody knows who owns it. 
and this is the vehicle for the getaway car for for corruption money. If you are a leader and you steal money, you're not going to walk to the local bank and put it there. Mm -hmm. But you have to put it through a shell company somewhere hidden behind some lawyers' names, etc. And we say that should that's illegal. That, that should be stopped. Why we need anonymous companies? And uh, again, we see governments dragging their feet on this issue. Corruption is a major issue, but we need everybody to be serious to address it. So yeah. it is not, I mean, Africa did not corner the market in corruption. I have to be clear about that. Right. Well, let me show our audience uh, where we are in terms of your Mo Ibrahim index of African governance for this year. Uh, and looking at this, just the summary, a third of the countries are driving overall import improvement in African governance. That has some level of being positive, but also a lot of room for improvement. Let's start with the, the positive countries. Where, where would you point to in the continent where you're saying, I'm so impressed by what they've been doing? Uh, clearly, the countries which are uh, top ranking in our index are the countries which are doing uh, quite well and moving forward. Uh, countries like uh, Namibia, like uh, uh, Botswana, Mauritius, uh, they're, they're doing well. Although sometimes also they stall here and there, but they are such, uh, achieve such high, uh, high marking. Uh, that really far ahead. So uh, in the top six or seven countries, they, they actually there hasn't been much movement. Uh, we see a country like Cape, Cape Verde is doing well. Sometimes it's, again, stole a little bit, but really up there. Uh, we have a number of really uh, good, co good countries which are uh, delivering services or people uh, uh, doing the right thing. Uh, then we have, of course, a small group of countries which are down there and have been down there for a long time. Uh, some, some of them suffer from conflicts and conflicts, armed conflicts and social unrest, uh, usually destroy governance. And, uh, but some of them came out of it and moved forward. Uh, so we are very happy with uh, Ivory, you know, Ivory Coast, for example. Uh, they came out from a difficult time, and now they're uh, one of the best improver, actually, uh, in our uh, uh, index. Uh, Tunisia is doing well. Uh, it's the only country which managed the, what they call the spring revolutions in a sensible way, and is moving forward. They have challenges but to join the top 10. So, Mo uh, Ibrahim, I, I hate to cut you off there, but because I, I love the list of the, the, the countries that are doing well, but unfortunately, there are many members of our community and some of the countries that may be not doing so well. So let's get straight to I, it. This is a tweet here. It's a, they're implicating a country. I think you can read through the lines. Pauline says, should leaders stay in power for 37 years? And of course, uh, she's referencing uh, President Robert Mugabe of uh, Uganda, uh, Zimbabwe, excuse me. Um, this is a video comment we actually got out of Zimbabwe about that leader. Have a listen uh, to what Unique Zimuto told us. You say the head of the fish rots first. When I look at the statement, I link it back to leadership. And with all that has been happening in my country, we've been plagued with so much corruption, you know, lack of transparency and accountability. I think of how the mindset of our leadership needs to change. So my question to you is, can we really teach an old dog new tricks? Can we change the mindset of our leadership? Now, of course, the top line uh, of the news day for Zimbabwe is that uh, Mugabe has ignored a ruling party a decision to make sure that he resigns. Uh, he faces impeachment now. So what do you make of uh, Unique's comment there? Uh, it is really a farce. For a number of years, I, I have been making statements about the situation in Zimbabwe and asking the question, how come uh, our continent is, is a continent of young people? vast majority of our people are below 18 years old. And why we have somebody at 93 years old think he can really 
plans the future of those young people who he knows nothing about them. Look, when you are 65 years old, if you are a teacher, engineer, doctor, whatsoever, people say, thank you very much, it's time to have a rest. Now, is Mugabe telling us that running a country is such a trivial job that somebody uh, cannot stay awake for two hours, uh, we should be able uh, to do it. It's, it's, it is ridiculous. And it is so sad that Mugabe, who has had been a hero of the independence struggle, end up his political life like this. If you leave on time, uh, people would, I mean, that, that would maintain his legacy. Mm -hmm. Look at Mandela. He came out of prison, served just one term. He did not even stay for a second term and say, okay, guys, goodbye, get somebody younger to do it. This is leadership. Let me just show you something. This is from, again, from this year's index. It's about human development. And for the, uh, the legend, anywhere that's green is showing improvement. Dark green, a lot of improvement. The pink areas are areas for concern. But I'm just thinking in terms of human resources on the African continent. It's young people that are so important. So this is a pretty good score for the continent, 56.1 out of 100. Why do you focus so much on the youth of the continent because you feel that they are critical to how it goes forward? Uh, number one, the majority of our population is young people. So that is that's the majority of our people. Secondly, that's our future. Uh, we have a tsunami of young people coming forward. Our demography, we have a huge bulge at this uh, uh, early ages of uh, our democracy is different from any other continent on earth and so this tsunami of young people huge number of young 15 million young people come to the marketplace to work working age every year 15 million people now that is a a two-edged sword if we train those people if you educate them we will have an amazing workforce in Africa. When Japanese are aging, Europeans are aging, there is a, there is not enough young people to really uh, run the states and services everywhere. And we have this wealth of young educated people. That's a great advantage for us. But if we fail to train, offer skills to these young people, what will happen? will end up with millions and millions of young people, frustrated, jobless, desperate. What are you going to do? They're going to die in the Sahara, trekking the Sahara. They're going to die in the Mediterranean, trying to cross to a better life. Uh, or they're going to pick up arms to join a terrorist group, and uh, at least they get paid doing that, and they pretend they have some kind of dignity or a mission carrying their machine guns. I, we have, this is the crucial issue for us. All the, our future in Africa depends on what's gonna, what we're going to do with our young people. Is it going to this way or is it going to go that way? So we, we really have to understand that. Well, there is someone here who would agree with you. Elio says, determination is already an established factor in African youths, but the finance is the major brouhaha to their entrepreneurial dreams. So one of the challenges there. But I want to pivot just a little bit uh, to play a video comment from a former president. This is uh, President Mugai, former president of Botswana, who was actually a recipient of your award in 2008. And here is what he told the stream. This recognition has allowed me to continue with my life after national office, focusing on a range of activities such as election observation, mediation, and participation in the activities of charitable foundations important to Africa, such as the Mo Ibrahim Foundation itself, the Mastercard Foundation, the African Wildlife Trust, and the African of the Year Award. I also continue to work with a range of partners to prevent the spread of HIV. Mo, what is your wish for African governments for the year ahead? A question straight to you, Mo Ibrahim. <laughs> well, I, I didn't hear the question uh, quite clearly. He's asking me... What's next and what is your wish for African governance for the year ahead? Very specific, 2018. 
I, I, I really hope to see an improvement in the education and training of young people. Sure, into the point. Mo, I'm just wondering with this index that comes out every year, there's not one in Europe, there's not one in Latin America, there's not one in the Americas, not one in Asia. What is it that it can do as an index to help the continent? Uh, I, I think what we're doing in Africa is unique. And uh, I hear many people would like to do the same for Asia and Europe. Bill Gates was very keen to try to persuade Europeans to do one for Europe, especially after the crisis in 2008. He spoke about that in Davos. and uh, But nobody came forward to do it. Uh, friends of, in, in Latin America and South America, they always say to me, oh, this is well, why do you come and do an index for us? And I say, no, 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 guys. I'm an African. Mm. I do Africa. Mm. You guys do your own continent. And, uh, well, I think some says some people will do something. I'm looking at some of the past recipients of the Mo Ibrahim Prize. Uh, an honorary prize went to Nelson Mandela. And then here are you with some past laureates. I'm just wondering, thinking ahead, could there be a former female president joining that lineup of laureates? Is that possible? Do you see that? What's your gut you, telling you? You are trying to persuade me <laughs> to say something about Ellen, I think. And I'm not going to say anything because I am, I'm not a member of the prize committee. Sure. I have no vote. I don't know what they discuss. It is a separate organization with their own resources, which does its research and decides. We know it a day before we go public. And in February, sometime in February, hopefully I'll be able to answer your question. Aha. Uh -huh. We have time for just one more video comment, and this is out of Khartoum. Have a listen to Shwagi. Putting in mind that the Sudanese government is now working on repairing their relations and ties with the global society, is there any new plans or programs that Mo Ibrahim is working on to respond to the recent critical needs in the social and in the economical fields? How do you contribute on empowering youth, knowing that two-thirds of the Sudanese community are between the age of 18 and 35? Is there any future visions or plans that include investing on youth by building their capacities to be the future leaders of Sudan? So he brings it back to the question of youth. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we, we, uh, we try to do what we can in that area. I mean, we have uh, a number of scholarships. We have a, a number of uh, uh, fellowships also. Uh, I don't know if uh, my friend there bothered to check in our website. He will, he will see uh, what we're trying to do. That although our core activity, really, core resource is going towards the issue of governance. But we encourage and work with other people. We also work with many other groups in civil society uh, to try really to help civil society to move forward. Uh, we intervene in behalf of civil society with governments when we see suppression of that. As far as the Sudanese uh, government, we tried a lot. We tried uh, in Darfur. We tried in the South. But unfortunately, there is misrule in Sudan, mm. both Sudan and South Sudan. Sudan is ranking number 50, and South Sudan is ranking number 50. Out of 54, yeah. Out of 54 countries. It's so sad. This is my country. This is my home. And uh, it is so sad. But again, uh, we have the same kind of, 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 of uh, government control mm. by uh, uh, one party and uh, one leader. So, Ibrahim, we're, we're right at the end of the show. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. I know there are two phrases that you don't particularly like about Africa. Africa basket case, Africa rising. Give us an alternative way to think of the African continent in a pithy sentence. Africa realism. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mo well, Ibrahim, it's been a pleasure having you here on the stream. Our conversation continues always online. Hashtag AJStream. See you soon.